Well, it's really several things. Uh, on a broad level, it's the statecraft by which you manage relations with other states. Uh, but it's also a technique of influence and persuasion, which is uh, both coercive and non-coercive. Um, it involves uh, getting other people to do things your way. Well, they do all sorts of things which uh, really are quite essential uh, to the country. It's not just uh, conducting uh, political negotiations on important matters, everything from arms control to uh, the management of treaties in wartime, uh, dividing enemies, uniting friends and allies. Uh, but it's also a wide range of services to American companies, to American individuals. A uh, good part of the Foreign Service is devoted to consular work, uh, which is not just about giving visas to foreigners, it's also about hauling Americans out of jail and uh, helping them when they're sick and uh, uh, helping them solve the problems they have uh, when they uh, travel abroad. So uh, trade promotion, investment facilitation, uh, helping individuals, helping companies, uh, a broad range of activities that have to be done. A Foreign Service officer hauled me out of jail in Mexico, uh, which, uh, uh, for which I'm eternally grateful. Uh, I was aware that the, we had a diplomatic service. I didn't really know much about what it did. Um, being allowed to sleep on the uh, kitchen floor in this guy's uh, house uh, made a favorable impression on me. Um, I wanted to find a career where I could do something larger than myself, serve the country, uh, but also escape boredom. Uh, the Foreign Service is a career in which every few years you change colleagues, you change cultural environments, you change locations, uh, you have to learn a new language or a new way of dealing with the world and how other people see it. Uh, so it's very stimulating and never boring and uh, uh, I had a great career. Well, you get shot at once in a while. Uh, you can be kidnapped or killed. Um, a lot of the world has a very difficult uh, health conditions. Uh, my first tour, which was in India, uh, cost me a son uh, to bad medical care. Uh, had we lived in the United States, he would still be with us. Uh, so it is like any career of service to your country, it is one in which you make sacrifices. Oh, that's hard to say. Um, shot at quite a number of times in different circumstances. Um, I think probably as ambassador to Riyadh during the Gulf War, watching scuds come down on my uh, residence from the balcony uh, and seeing the shrapnel hit the swimming pool was quite exciting. Diplomacy is part of a national security function. Uh, basically, statesmen have three broad instruments with which to relate to the world beyond their borders. Uh, they, the diplomats, who are the eyes and ears and hands of the government overseas. Spies, uh, who are people who steal secrets, try to persuade foreigners to betray their country and help us. Uh, and soldiers, military, airmen, marines, navy personnel, uh, who uh, apply force when that's required. So you have the military, you have the espionage apparatus, and you have the diplomats. When I was in India, um, I um, was assigned, uh, to my surprise, uh, to the United States Information Service, which uh, was precisely devoted to um, telling America's story abroad. Uh, in that role, uh, I did everything from arrange dance performances and musical 
um, concerts, uh, to uh, give lectures, arrange for academic programs on American culture and civilization. Uh, and uh, I must say that was a very stimulating experience too. Uh, and I was very young. It was a great management experience. I had a huge number of local employees, Indians, working for me, uh, and um, very smart people uh, who were quite uh, dedicated to the cause of helping their fellow Indian citizens understand the United States. Well, I think there are several reasons. Um, one is just a matter of egotism. Uh, as a country, we're proud of what we are and who we are and what we've accomplished, and we'd like other people to know about that. Uh, but beyond that, uh, uh, understanding the United States and Americans uh, helps foreigners avoid making mistakes in dealing with us. And uh, assuming that they like what they learn about us, it makes them more open to doing things our way when we ask them to do that. I'm not sure that the level of risk has changed a great deal. Um, the risk to American citizens has clearly gone up, uh, but uh, diplomats have always been on the front line of national security. Um, and in my early days in the Foreign Service, there were quite a number of colleagues who were assassinated or uh, suffered injury in the course of some incident or other. Uh, I don't think that's changed. Uh, there is a kind of uh, security mania now uh, reflecting a zero risk mentality here in the United States, uh, which frankly uh, I don't particularly sympathize with. I think life is about risks uh, and uh, that you should be prepared to accept those. And part of serving the country is taking risks on its behalf, in my view. Well, um, I remember when I was the, uh, in effect, the chief operational officer, uh, the DCM or deputy chief of mission in Beijing, uh, there was a very gifted and able political counselor who oversaw quite a large political section, people trying to understand Chinese politics and Chinese foreign policy. And in the afternoon, he used to go through his section, and if he saw anybody sitting at his or her desk, he would say to them, why are you here? You can sit at a desk in Washington, but here you are in Beijing. Your value consists in your contact with the Chinese. If you don't have an appointment, go out and sit in the park and talk to people. Um, and um, I think um, we have swung much too far against that uh, with uh, embassies that in some respects uh, resemble crusader castles in which people cower behind barriers and where the citizens of the host country find it difficult to uh, feel welcome. So uh, I think, in my view, the balance has to be very strongly in favor of contact. Uh, diplomacy is a people-intensive piece of work. Uh, it is not done in the abstract. It can't be done uh, by email. It has to be done face to face to be effective. Well, I think there are all sorts of effects uh, of technology. Um, paradoxically, uh, we have far fewer foreign correspondents now than we did. In, in 1947, um, I am told, we had 2,500 foreign correspondents. They're less than 200 today. So uh, the sort of broad, uh, unstructured information that uh, uh, newspaper journalists used to provide isn't, isn't there. Uh, we have a lot of detail that comes from social media, uh, and we have a lot of narratives that are written not on the basis of first-hand observation. What diplomats do is go and talk to the people who actually make decisions or who know what decisions are being made and talk to them in a way where 
uh, they can be reasonably confident, absent WikiLeaks, uh, that uh, their confidence will be respected um, and that what they say will be understood and reported faithfully uh, back to the government of wh whichever government the diplomat works for. Uh, so I think uh, diplomacy hasn't at all lost its importance. It's an in-depth, face-to-face method of communication that really can't be replaced uh, by electronic journalism or social media. I think, uh, frankly, it has been over-politicized at the top. Uh, the number of unqualified political appointees in ambassadorial positions is unprecedentedly high. Uh, the dysfunction in our government generally means that um, very often diplomatic posts are left vacant. Uh, as Russia and uh, the United States, NATO and Europe were busily pulling Ukraine apart uh, back in 2014, uh, we had no ambassador in Moscow for five months. Uh, that is simply uh, unacceptable. Uh, the United States now is the only country that considers diplomacy an amateur sport uh, and staffs it with people with no experience who have to learn on the job. Some do fine. Most don't. It's both. Um, I think the, there is an issue for the Foreign Service in that, by definition, someone who doesn't know how to do his or her job can't mentor people who are apprenticing to it. Uh, so uh, the level of the quality of the Foreign Service as a whole is adversely affected by having amateur leaders. Um, it also uh, basically uh, trivializes the American image abroad. Uh, when we appoint an ambassador who can't speak the local language and isn't even sure uh, who the prime minister is or what party he or she belongs to, uh, we look unserious. No, diplomacy has been uh, essential to the growth and power of our country from the very beginning. We became independent through a negotiation that resulted in a treaty in which the British recognized our independence. It wouldn't be independent except for that. Uh, the Mexican-American War was settled after it had been fought with Mexico, and Mexico, Mexico agreed to transfer California, Texas, and much of the west of the United States uh, to us. Um, Alaska is part of the United States because the Secretary of State negotiated that. The Louisiana Purchase was a negotiation in the time of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, so uh, diplomacy has been an integral part of our history, and we wouldn't be what we are today without it. Diplomacy is, in our country, is still basically a proto-profession. But in 1924, uh, legislation was passed that eliminated the complete amateur hour we'd had before. And it brought consular officers, the people who are the hands-on assistants to Americans abroad and who help foreigners uh, find their way to the United States as immigrants, it brought them, the consular officers and the diplomats, uh, together in one service. And that's been a great strength of the Foreign Service. I think to the extent we have problems today, the best answer to them is probably reaffirming the spirit of the Rogers Act. The invasion and occupation of Iraq uh, with no real plan for an occupation uh, kindled a sectarian war. Uh, it's not the case that there were no differences between Shia and Sunni in, in the Arab world or in Iraq, there were but they were peacefully uh, fought out. Um, there was a great deal of intermarriage in Iraq between people of these different schools of Islam. Um, what our arrival and the destruction of the Iraqi regime did, not, the, not regime change, but regime removal and, in effect, the destruction of the state, 
what this did was to set off a sectarian violence uh, which has continued to spiral along and has now produced the so-called Islamic State, which is erasing the borders of the Levant and the Fertile Crescent that were established a uh, hundred years ago. No, I think the borders in the region uh, are being uh, redrawn. Uh, countries are being partitioned. Uh, statelets are replacing, are replacing states. Uh, religious differences which uh, were dealt with through tolerance are now the subject of violent crimes. Uh, so I think we inadvertently catalyzed uh, Quite a, quite a mess. Uh, or, or let me put it a different way. Um, we, we went as, abroad in search of monsters to destroy. We found some. We bred some more. Some of them are following us home. That wasn't smart. In Syria, there, are, there is, of course, a civil strife uh, between uh, the government, uh, which is Alawite dominated, uh, but includes a significant Christian component, uh, secular Sunnis uh, with the government, uh, and the Sunni majority, some portion of which is extremist, militant. Um, so there's a civil war, uh, but there is also a struggle between Iran and Saudi Arabia and Qatar and the other Gulf Arabs for influence in Syria. Uh, the Gulf Arabs have sought to overthrow the Assad regime uh, and have fed the fighting. And in a sense, it's also become a struggle between the United States and Russia. So it is a very complicated situation in which domestic civil strife is fed and sustained by outside involvement. We have a sort of naive impulse to uh, endorse democracy wherever it appears to be appearing. Uh, and then very often we discover that the people who are elected uh, are uh, violently in disagreement with us on important matters. And then sometimes, uh, particularly in the Middle East, we have a habit of overthrowing them or trying to undo the results of the election somehow. Uh, this is uh, not a productive cycle to be uh, going through. Uh, in the end, uh, democracy, as was the case in England from which we got our own traditions, has to evolve domestically. It can't be imposed. Uh, so we should be prepared to hold out a helping hand uh, to people who are trying to democratize their countries, but we should not insist on democracy, nor should we ourselves uh, try to impose it. We have a dilemma. Uh, Iraq has been divided into three parts, Kurdistan, a, a part of the Islamic State, and a Sunni extremist dominated and a Shia dominated pro-Iranian realm. Um, Syria has similarly been divided. The border between the two has essentially been erased. Um, you can't conduct a policy of degrading and destroying the Islamic State in only Iraq. You have to deal with it in Syria. But that involves difficult and some might say obnoxious choices. Uh, do we align ourselves with Iran, with Hezbollah, with the Assad regime in Syria uh, because we have a common enemy in the Islamic State. So there's no easy answer. Uh, the one thing one can be absolutely certain of is that there is no military answer to this problem. Uh, that means there has to be a diplomatic answer. What does that mean? That means putting together an alliance of like-minded countries who feel the threat with Muslims in the lead because this, in the end, is a problem within Islam that only the adherents of that faith can resolve.
No, I think Ukraine um, ought to be uh, a independent, prosperous, strong borderland between Russia and the European Union. Uh, and in the end, I hope Russia and Europe, the United States supporting Europe, will come to that conclusion and act accordingly. Uh, everybody has a great deal to gain by not making Ukraine a cockpit of contention and war. Sanctions are not an effective response uh, to this sort of challenge. Um, they entrench differences. They don't bridge them. Uh, they create vested interests in uh, adversary relationship. They distort markets. Uh, they uh, therefore create people with an interest in their continuation. Um, sanctions are useful as a negotiating tool, as an adjunct to a tool. If you have a yesable proposition, you can increase the prospects that the other side will agree to it if you add a threat. Uh, but just imposing sanctions accomplishes absolutely nothing except appeasing domestic political critics. Well, I had the opportunity to participate in a very classic diplomatic exercise, not much known, um, which was uh, the, the policy of negotiating a removal of Cuban forces from Angola and the South African occupation from Namibia. Um, I say this was classic because the United States essentially created linkages that everybody resisted, nobody liked, but in the end forced everybody to compromise. The Cubans went home, the South Africans left Namibia, Namibia became independent. Angola had an opportunity uh, to make peace among its warring factions and did so and then lost that peace. Uh, but we gave them a fair shot. Um, it was a great achievement, almost entirely unsupported by the Congress or the public in the United States. And it actually ended up having something to do with uh, changing the attitudes of South Africa's white supremacists uh, against apartheid. Uh, that is to say, uh, if you ask F.W. de Klerk, who released Nelson Mandela, I was meeting with him actually when he made th that decision. Uh, if you ask him what caused him to have a crisis of conscience and to believe that South Africa could end apartheid and deal with the rest of Africa on an equal basis, he would tell you that that diplomacy, which uh, was the creation of Assistant Secretary Chester Crocker, was what did it. Well, Ed Perkins is a, a man of great dignity uh, and self-possession who rose, he was a sergeant in the Army, um, he rose from the enlisted ranks in the Foreign Service to the very highest level, ambassador to several countries, including South Africa, where he did a very distinguished job under terribly difficult circumstances. Uh, I remember traveling with him in the wine country outside Cape Town, which is the essential home of Afrikanerdom. It's where the Afrikaans language was created, really. Um, and uh, seeing the kindness but the terribly uh, offensive condescension with which some of the Afrikaners dealt with this tall, very black American. Uh, I was proud to have known him. Well, I think their training is, is superb. Um, it's uh, total immersion, and if you give your all to it, it works. Uh, I remember starting Chinese um, in, uh, I think, January 2nd, 1969, and um, a big, tall, northern Chinese guy came into the room, said, uh, I'm Li Zongmi, I'm going to be your 
instructor, um, I'm going to speak English with you just this once, never again. But before we start, I'd like you to know that, uh, well, probably some people have told you that Chinese is a hard language. You just don't believe them. There are 850 million people at that time uh, who speak it. Most of them are dumb as doorposts. And uh, if you weren't smart, you wouldn't be here in the room. And if you work hard, you'll learn the language. I studied Chinese first in Washington. I had a tour in India first, learned Tamil uh, on my own, um, then studied Chinese first in Washington and in Taiwan. And after I was pulled out of Taiwan to interpret for the Warsaw Talks, which were uh, discussions between us and the Chinese held at the, in Poland uh, when we didn't have any sort of other dialogue. Uh, those talks were canceled, uh, but I was, uh, they were quite insistent that I get back, and uh, it became apparent that the reason for that was the preparation for Kissinger's secret trip in uh, July of 1971. I wrote a lot of the papers for that without uh, knowing exactly what they were for. I knew there was to be an emissary to China, but I didn't know it was Kissinger. Um, and I spent a lot of time, in retrospect, um, on the China desk, uh, helping allies understand that we were about to uh, change our posture vis-a-vis -vis China, which up to that time had been uh, total isolation, ostracism, embargo. Well, um, it's actually a bit embarrassing in terms of the Nixon White House's approach to things. Um, uh, I was locked up in the operations center at the State Department. Uh, I'm told that I wrote 47 percent of the material for the, for the trip, uh, but nobody told me anything about going on it. Um, I went home one day, and there were baggage tags shoved through the uh, the letter, you know, the letter slot in the door. And um, uh, so I found, and then I somebody sent me Time Magazine, which had an article about me, mostly wrong. Um, so um, I was sort of uh, clearly um, uh, considered to be a, a spear carrier who could be ordered wherever I wanted to be. Um, going across the Pacific. Uh, first, with a stop in Honolulu, at Pearl Harbor, Hickam Air Force Base, and then uh, a brief rest stop in Guam before going to Shanghai to change planes and go up to Beijing. Um, nobody told me what I was to do. And uh, we arrived in Beijing, um, and it wasn't clear uh, what role I was to have. Um, and in fact, I didn't uh, find out until uh, after a brief encounter with the president, who I thought was going to tell me what he wanted me to do, but he didn't. He just said he was glad to meet me. And um, I noticed uh, he had uh, three hairs in the groove of his nose, uh, with uh, one of them had a sort of blob of Max Factor or something on it, which was quite impressive. I'd never seen a man um, in makeup before, except on a, in a TV studio. Um, anyway, he didn't tell me anything. And um, he went off to see Chairman Mao, excluding the State Department, uh, the Secretary of State, and everybody else. And that evening, uh, I was summoned back to his villa in the State Guest House compound. And uh, his appointment secretary, uh, Dwight Chapin, later convicted of perjury, uh, apparently correctly, um, uh, said to me that the president wanted me to interpret his banquet toast that night. And I said that was fine and uh, asked for a copy of the text. And Chapin said he didn't think there was one. And I said, well, I know there is, so uh, I'd very much like to see it. Um, and uh, he went in to see the president, came out again, says the president said he's going to speak extemporaneously. There's no text, and he wants you to do it. And I said, well, that's not right. I'm, I, uh, I said, this isn't Sp Spanish or French. This is something else. And um, there is a text, and I really need to see it. He went back in, came out, and said, the president said there's no text, and he orders you to interpret. 
And I said, Mr. Chapin, it might interest you to know that I drafted the toast tonight. Uh, and I'm aware that in the NSC, somebody added some of Chairman Mao's poetry to it. And if you think I'm going to get up in front of the entire Chinese establishment and on global television and ad lib Chairman Mao's poetry from a bad translation back into Chinese, you're out of here. And then I used a foul word, mind. Um, uh, whereupon he reached in his pocket, took out the text, and gave it to the Chinese. So it was a memorable moment. I sat at the head table with the president glowering at me, figuring that uh, my career was finished and uh, that I'd be lucky to get a job in the Forest Service in Alaska. And um, the, uh, one of the senior Chinese, later, who later became president of China, president offered me a cigarette. and. Like a condemned man, I took it. So I know exactly when I started smoking and uh, where and when. And uh, I didn't stop for about 30 years. Well, the, the, the purpose of the trip was, uh, I think, nicely encapsulated in the, uh, in the uh, name of the series of telegrams that referred to it, which had at the end Homer which wasn't the blind poet, uh, but uh, a home run in baseball, that the single move that adds a score, uh, that changes the game. And uh, this was intended to change the game with the Soviet Union and with Vietnam. It certainly worked in the first case. Uh, I don't think it worked with Vietnam. Uh, but in effect, we were rearranging geopolitics. There was very little thought to what sort of bilateral relationship we might have to China. I actually added to the communique draft uh, the few lines about opening trade and cultural relations, which had not been in there. And uh, so um, it was a major world event uh, with no thought of how it might transform either China or the United States. There was essentially no relationship uh, it was illegal for Americans to buy any Chinese product anywhere. Uh, we couldn't go to China. Our passports were not valid for travel there. Um, Chinese officials could not come to the United States uh, because uh, the government in Taipei, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's government, represented China both in the United Nations and here. And we did everything we could to exclude Beijing from any kind of access to international activity. So the Nixon trip really was a radical change. Uh, it was a bold move. It was a home run. And uh, I think, uh, from my point of view, since I entered the Foreign Service hoping to be part of some move toward China, uh, this was uh, just a remarkable event. Well, um, of course, uh, a great deal of the preparation work for uh, the, the trip uh, was done at the State Department, uh, then filtered through the National Security Council staff. Uh, the senior man there was uh, on China, was a Foreign Service officer, later ambassador to Singapore and Indonesia, John Holdridge, a very competent uh, Chinese specialist. Um, the logistical support in the end was worked out uh, by the, the act, acting assistant secretary, deputy assistant secretary for administration at the State Department. Um, so uh, at every stage, even though we didn't have any embassy or other representation in China, uh, the Foreign Service played an important role in shaping the event and ensuring its success. No, it was simply unimaginable. Uh, somebody wrote, uh, once the fact of the visit became public, somebody from Texas wrote, he was an, uh, a casket manufacturer, and uh, he knew there were a lot of Chinese and figured a lot of them died every year, and he wanted to make sure the president offered to sell caskets to China. Um, I got the responsibility to replying uh, to that letter and uh, didn't think it was too wise to lead off with the Chinese by expressing the hope that more of them die. Uh, so we didn't do that. Uh, no, there was no thought at all. No imagine, no, nobody imagined 
that China would become the incredible capitalist success that it has, because at that time it was the opposite. It was a miserable socialist failure. Kissinger actually was uh, initially reluctant. This was Nixon's idea. Kissinger carried it off brilliantly, I think. Um, he's a very gifted negotiator. He's obviously a very smart and, in many ways, very wise man about foreign affairs. Um, and uh, he managed to tap into the uh, Foreign Service uh, and use it uh, very effectively. Often he did so despite institutional barriers. Uh, when we did the preparations for his trip, they were done essentially behind the back of the Secretary of State, which was very awkward. Uh, but in the end, we got the job done. The meeting began with a famous handshake. John Foster Dulles had refused to shake Zhou Enlai's hand in Geneva during the conference that ended the first round of Indochina wars. Um, President Nixon made a point of extending his hand to Zhou Enlai, and it was warmly received. Um, the Chinese officials were as intrigued, interested, excited, uh, about getting to know us as we were about getting to know them, because we had been 23 years without any contact at all. At that time, trade was really not on either side's mind very much. Um, the Chinese wanted to see the end of all of the embargo and restrictions. Uh, they wanted to see a compromise or a resolution of the Taiwan issue. Um, we had grave disagreements about virtually everything from the Vietnam War to the situation in Korea or Kashmir. Um, trade was not thought to be a big item. And um, as I recall, it was barely discussed. There had been 136 meetings at the ambassadorial level, first in Geneva and later in Warsaw. Uh, this was a very restricted channel. Uh, it wasn't used very effectively until the last few meetings, which did play a role in laying the basis for both the Kissinger and Nixon trips. This was 1972. Uh, President Nixon was running for re-election, a second term. Watergate happened. Um, in 1973, we agreed to the exchange of liaison offices. Uh, there was still the issue that the United States recognized a different Chinese government, the one in Taipei. Uh, but uh, we did institutionalize the relationship. We exchanged offices, assigned diplomats, to them, and that was a good thing, because we had a political succession crisis in the U.S. coming out of Watergate, and the Chinese did too, coming out of what they call the Gang of Four. Uh, so we survived that. Uh, we had uh, institutional and personal connections that enabled us to carry forward, but it wasn't for another six years that we normalized relations and established embassies. No, I actually think, you know, I mean, I was actually the trade officer for China at that time. But it was an extremely easy job because there was virtually no trade. I think in 1971, there was $5 million of trade between the two countries. In 1972, there was $95 million. We do that much in about a minute now. Um, so um, uh, while the, a great deal of what I was doing as a foreign service officer was counseling American business folk who were trying to open relationships with the Chinese, uh, try to, trying to understand the Chinese market and the opportunities it represented. And it was all very novel. Uh, I had the experience of uh, giving an interview to uh, one uh, set of people in my office. They asked if they could record it. I said, no problem. Uh, uh, then they came back the following week for a second session. And uh, I later discovered they were selling these tapes for $3,000 apiece. Um, I, of course, was a government official. I had helped them for free. 
Uh, but it gave me the thought that maybe what was doing something useful that had some economic value in the marketplace. Well, uh, the framework for all of this uh, was set through negotiations mainly uh, between, uh, well, between the U.S. government and the Chinese government, uh, mainly conducted by career foreign service people. I personally inv was involved in the negotiation of 36 such agreements. We wouldn't have uh, airline relationships, for example, if we didn't have an air traffic agreement. Uh, we wouldn't have uh, the kind of trade we do if we didn't have a mutual reduction of tariffs, most favored nation treatment, uh, and so forth. Uh, all of this uh, was carried out by the career uh, people uh, of the Foreign Service, uh, often in support of political appointees, but sometimes uh, without such people.